What's up guys, welcome to another video brought to you by The Simple Engineer. In today's video, we're gonna talk about asynchronicity in JavaScript. We're gonna understand the concurrency model, how to basically employ the handling of asynchronous calls in the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk about Node, compare it to other popular technologies like Apache and Nginx. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll really understand the evolution of design patterns that have come about over the years, things like uh, callbacks, promises, async await, and named functions. So the first thing we need to understand about JavaScript is JavaScript is a single-threaded synchronous blocking language. And what this means is when we look at something that is single-threaded, it means that only one thing is executing at a given time. When we're talking about something that is synchronous, it means the code is going to execute in the order in which it appears. So for something that is synchronous, we can imagine you know, four boxes in a very linear order, and these things are going to execute one at a time, and the next box isn't going to be executed until the previous function in the previous box has completed. When we're talking about other languages that support parallelism and these concurrency principles, we could take basically two of these boxes, execute them simultaneously, and then continue executing down the chain. So when we're talking about JavaScript, you may ask for something that is so prevalent in browsers, when we're doing IO intensive operations like database reads, writes, file writes, etc., how can we do these time consuming things without blocking the UI thread from rendering? And that's where the power of asynchronicity in JavaScript really comes into play. To best understand how asynchronicity is handled in JavaScript, that brings us to the event loop mechanism, which is really the concurrency model that JavaScript uses to ensure that we're not blocking the main thread. So JavaScript is split up into really two main pieces. We have the heap, which is where all the unstructured region of memory for the allocation of objects exists. And we have the call stack. And the call stack essentially says, hey, what function is executing right now and what function is going to execute next? So as we execute uh, lines of code in our program, it adds them sequentially to the call stack and we pop them off in a first in in last out manner. Uh, and we do this synchronously and all on one single thread. And this is the kind of single threaded component of JavaScript. In the instance that we get something that is going to be IO intensive or something that is attached to some sort of event, then we talk to the browser API. So that could be set timeout, set interval. It could be an Ajax request. And we essentially say, hey, add this thing into the browser API. So if we specify a five second delay, it'll wait in the browser. But then we pass in a callback and the callback essentially says when this when this time consuming IO blocking operation completes, then call this function with the response, whether it's from like a request, like an Ajax call. And we're going to take that callback and we're going to place it onto something known as the event queue. And the event queue is essentially a queue that manages all the callbacks for all the asynchronous calls that we execute. So if I make an Ajax request to a server, it's going to do its thing on the background in a different thread executed from the browser. JavaScript is gonna continue executing all of these synchronous calls on the call stack. And when I get my response from the browser, I add that callback associated with that Ajax call into the event queue. We begin popping items off the event queue in a first in, first out fashion. The second that we take something from the event queue and place it on the call stack to be executed is when the call stack has been emptied and there are no more operations to execute. And this is kind of how we allow blocking operations to be executed without actually affecting the user experience, like freezing the main UI thread and blocking the rendering pipeline of a browser web page, for example. The last thing I want to talk about before we actually dive into some coding samples for how to handle asynchronous calls is exactly the comparison of Node.js to other technologies. Node.js is commonly referred to as a beast when talking about uh, handling operations that are IO specific, uh, where Node is not really super, super great is handling things that are CPU intensive. Basically, a quick example of that, you know, for things like doing database reads and writes, it's really good because we handle all concurrent requests on a single thread through the event loop. But for things that are blocking, such as database requests and Ajax requests, uh, Node utilizes a C++ library called libuv, and it will spawn multiple threads to handle these types of things. And then we handle the responses using these asynchronous
asynchronous callbacks in the event queue. For other technologies, such as Apache or Engine X, each request that comes in spawns an entirely new thread. And this is actually a somewhat poor thing for IO because when we're doing something that is blocking, the entire thread freezes until something like a database request or some IO operation is fully complete. And so while that's happening, the thread is frozen and the request isn't fully fulfilled. Therefore, nothing else is executing. That's different than the JavaScript model because we're still executing things on a single thread on the event loop, but we're still doing asynchronous calls almost in a background worker thread because Node.js takes advantage of that. So it's non-blocking. And that's a really big benefit that we get for having this asynchronous communication. The first example we're gonna run through is essentially how we handle asynchronous calls with callbacks. I've written a dummy program here that simulates us making an asynchronous request like an Ajax call. We utilize the response to then write it to disk and then we modify it a little bit. And then we take that modified response and we send an email. Because these things are written sequentially, we would expect that we would have the variable, we could use it here, and then we could take this variable and use it here. Let's go ahead and execute this code. You'll see first we write to disk which is really strange because that's the second function that's called. We make the request second, and then we send an email. All the variables that we use within this program are actually undefined, which is really strange because we would think that we could access them. But as we've learned previously, JavaScript uses the event loop model, and these things basically get added into the event queue and get called once the request has been completed in full. A way to handle this or really simulate the idea of synchronous execution or ensuring that these things happen in a more linear order, we need to replace them with something known as callbacks. And a callback is just a function that's going to execute when the code inside of the asynchronous function has completed successfully. I'm going to delete these variable assignments. And what we're going to do is we're essentially going to say when make request finishes, let's call this function. It doesn't take in a parameter, but it has a function now as a parameter. So now we need to add a function into this parameter and we'll call it callback. And we'll say when that finishes, we're going to give it a result. And this will be the response. And then what we want to say is when we get the response, we want to call write response and it's going to take in the response. And when write response is finished writing to disk, we wanna take the modified response and we wanna pass it into the emailer. So we pass in another callback and we say, okay, we've modified the response, now we wanna send an email. So we're gonna say send response email. It's going to take in the modified response to send to some recipient. And then finally, we'll get a final result from the emailer and we will just say console.log final result is final result. We need to make some modifications to our original program. Uh, instead of returning, we are gonna call the callback function because we're gonna invoke a function with the response information. Write response now takes in another callback itself. So we're going to do the same pattern below, replacing return with the callback function name. And then we need to modify the response email to do the same and we'll replace return with callback. So now we would expect that although these things execute at various different intervals, they take different times, uh, we should still get a somewhat sequential execution uh, response within our uh, console without any undefines. So we'll run this, we make a request, we write the response to disk, we modify it before we send the email, and then our final result is correct. The one side that I will make is you see that this indentation can get extremely large and really hard to read. And this is what we call callback hell, and this becomes extremely hard to deal with as our callbacks grow in size. The solution to this callback hell problem brings us to the idea of promises. But before we dive into that, I just wanna to quickly touch on the idea of what is known as named functions. Named functions is another way of cleaning up callbacks without fully addressing the problem. And it allows us to basically replace these anonymous functions with a name. So I can come in here and I can say handle final results. I match the signature of the anonymous function. So this is final results and I can just take in the body of the anonymous function and put it into the actual function. Now I can delete this. This will take in handle final result with no parameters. 
And you see that we just cleaned up our callback a lot. We can do the same thing with each of these anonymous functions and it starts to become a lot more linear. As we start to execute this code, you'll notice that we get the exact same results. Uh, it's just that it's cleaned up a little bit. We are now brought to almost the final design pattern and that's the idea of utilizing promises to remediate the callback hell problem. Essentially a promise is a way of handling asynchronous calls to where a promise is pending as the execution of the call is happening and if it was successful then we resolve the promise and if it was unsuccessful we reject it. In order to refactor this code to support the idea of promises we essentially just wrap the asynchronous piece of the call in something known as a promise. So we can return a new promise. It's going to take in two parameters. Parameters are going to be called resolve and reject. We can place this code inside. And instead of having a callback, we're just going to say resolve. We can delete the callback parameter and we'll do the same thing for all of these. We'll return a new promise, resolve, reject, we will delete the callback as well. We'll just resolve this. And then finally for the last one, we will return a new promise. And we will resolve the callback and delete it as well. In order for this to work successfully, we need to also refactor these callback functions. First, we're gonna make the request. And after that, the syntax says we call dot then with the response, and with that response, we're going to call write response. It's going to take in the response object as a parameter, and since that returns a promise, we can call dot then on that, and this is going to be called modified response. And with that modified response, we can send the response email with the modified response. Because that returns a, a promise as well, we can take the final result, and we can more or less just copy this and watch it replicate the exact same previous behavior. So we can delete this. You see that we get the exact same behavior, but it's cleaned up a lot more. We can even clean this up a little bit more. We can essentially replace this first parameter with just the function name. So we can come in here and say, write response. We can replace this with send response email. And we'll leave this one as is. And if we rerun it, you can see we also get the exact same result because JavaScript can infer the parameters to these functions. So just another way to clean up the callback hell issue. This brings us to our last pattern. And you may be wondering, how is it possible to improve this code even more? This brings us to async await, somewhat newer guy on the block, and it's really just syntactic sugar around promises. Essentially what it does is it allows us to have our code read in a more synchronous execution fashion. And what we do for this to work is we create a new function, we prepend it with the async keyword. We can call it whatever we want. I'm gonna say execute request. We are going to just create standard variable assignments like we tried in the beginning. We'll say var uh, response equals make request. And because this is asynchronous, we need to prepend it with the await, await flag. From there, we will take the response and we'll say var modified response equals await, and we'll say write response with the previous value. And we'll then say var final results equals send response email with the modified response. And then we will prepend this with await. And then finally, we will console log the final result. We can delete this previous code and we will just call execute request. You'll see we get the exact same execution, but now we have it read in a very synchronous way. So that does it with all the design patterns and evolution of ways of handling the asynchronous nature of JavaScript. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. If you have questions, feel free to leave a comment.